Well, welcome along to Live On Air this evening. Uh, we're particularly grateful that uh, David Lorimer from the Scientific and Medical Network has been able to join with us. David has been instrumental in bringing the network's news and its opinions and views and uh, scientific papers and so on. He's been bringing them to public attention now for a very, very long time. And would you like to just tell us a little bit about your background and um, uh, a brief overview of the Scientific and Medical Network? Yes, thank you, David. <clears throat> well, I've been working with the network now since 1986. Um, so that's over 30 years. And prior to that, uh, I was teaching um, French, German, and philosophy, uh, mainly at an old public school called Winchester, Winchester College. And while I was there, I uh, wrote my first book, um, <clears throat> which was called Survival? Uh, question mark. And this is, in fact, um, going to come out again. Um, both my books are being reprinted uh, towards the end of the year with slightly different titles. <clears throat> and so it's quite exciting to see them coming back into print after them being out of print for well over 20 years. And so my, my interests um, have grown sort of with those of the network, if you like, but I, um, I was involved in the 1980s a lot um, in uh, near-death experiences and the implications of near-death experiences. And I think since the time I've been involved in the network, you know, the, the whole uh, consciousness field has, has exploded, really. And since 1995, we've been running the Beyond the Brain conference. So we've got one coming up in um, at the end of October um, with uh, some very good speakers. And in fact, some of you, you may not know <clears throat> that we have a dedicated site and um, for the Beyond the Brain, which is beyondthebrain.org. Uh, so you can have a look at uh, all the details of the conference and indeed details of some of the old conferences on that website, which is currently being being developed. And uh, over the, our, our conference um, uh, period, our, our conference program over this uh, period has also grown uh, very considerably. And we've been running the um, Mystics and Scientists Conference um, since the late 1980s. And we just celebrated the 40th anniversary um, of um, that series of conferences. And I, I have another, <clears throat> a number of other things that I've, I've been interested in. Um, I've previously been president of the Swedenborg Society, uh, for instance, and also president of Reekin Trust, which was started up by um, Sir George Trevelyan. Uh, and that's just um, <clears throat> finished its cycle of activity. And, and I've been involved in the International Futures Forum, um, which is a, a sort of think tank uh, trying to um, negotiate and navigate <clears throat> the complex challenges that we have in the world today. And um, I, I've just recently returned from the mountains of Bulgaria, <clears throat> where I've, I've been on a sort of two-week retreat um, with um, my... Um, uh, friends in the mountains and doing the wonderful um, panurhythmy dance, sacred dance. And in fact, as we speak, <clears throat> the, the festival of the, um, uh, the White Brotherhood is taking place in the Rila Mountains on 19th, 20th and 21st of August. And so today there'll probably be a thousand people um, dancing panurhythmy up in the mountains, which is quite, some, quite something. So there's a few sort of sketches of background. Well, that, that's a wonderful introduction, David. Uh, the Beyond the Brain conferences were where I first became very much aware of the work of the network, and I attended the first one, uh, and I think I've been to two subsequently. And uh, then when you mentioned uh, all the work that came out of, around near-death experience, um, it's, it's kind of an entree point into a world of science that interfaces with medicine, philosophy, theology, and and wisdom studies. Totally. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is the most dynamic and incredibly interesting organization, and one could just become totally immersed in it. Uh, the, the, the news and the the opinions that come out 
and you've been editing their magazine um, for a very, very long time. And what a what an absolute treat it is every um, four months or so to get the network magazine. There's nothing quite like it. It's it's an incredible. Yeah, well, I, I <laughs> I've just today. I think I'll probably finish the the, the short reviews, and and I'm I'm getting up towards fifteen thousand words on those, and uh, I don't know whether it's exciting or depressing that um, the shelf is already full of books that I haven't read, um, which will have to wait for the next issue. So they the, they seem to be coming in at an even faster rate than before. And if you look back to about 1996, then about 6,000 books um, have been through the network system. So it gives you some idea of the quantity. It, it, it's, it's running at about 250 a year. That sort of, and that's the kind of number I receive through the post box. Uh, I don't think uh, very many people would be aware that you're a phenomenal speed reader. <laughs> Well, it's, an, it's, a, it's a matter of trying to um, extract <clears throat> uh, the, the essence and, and something interesting from the book um, because, you know, you can't read every page of every book. It simply isn't possible. Um, but um, when you've been at it for so long, you, you get to the point where you have a very good sense of where the book fits in to, what, to other books in the field and, and therefore what its unique contribution is. Well, David, we're going to look at uh, that the SciMed Network uh, commissioned, and it's looked at um, France, Germany, and Britain, and about a thousand scientists have responded from each of those countries to this uh, uh, question of how their science interfaces with faith, spirituality, um, and religion. And I wonder if you could please uh, here we are uh, with the first page of your executive summary of the report. Health approaches in these different countries. Um, this, this is fascinating. What, what's the main finding for you of this um, particular data? Well, I think if you look at the... the, the um, actually, what, before we just do that, let me just give you a little bit of background on the survey, which may be of interest um, to people. And that, that is that the, the, the idea was initiated by, by Rupert Sheldrake. And, and Rupert um, had the feeling and was approached by the, um, uh, the Salvia Foundation for some ideas. He had the feeling that um, quite a lot of scientists um, might have had interesting experiences um, or be practicing or be open to religion and spirituality, but wouldn't really admit it to their colleagues. And so the question was, um, if we did a survey on an anonymous basis, would this show that larger numbers of people were interested in these areas and then might be apparent in the public? Because the, the press is predominantly um, what we might call... Um, you know, humanistic or enlightenment rationalist. <clears throat> and, and, and the press uh, is more inclined towards, I think, um, atheism and uh, agnosticism. Uh, and so they, they tend to <clears throat> exaggerate, I think, the extent to which science is associated with atheism and agnosticism. So that, that's a bit of background. Uh, now these, we asked quite a number of different questions, as you'll see, um, from the, the survey. And uh, if you look at this particular page, the striking thing um, is the, the difference um, in the different countries um, of complementary um, medicine, uh, use of complementary medicine. We asked if people had used any of these approaches personally in the last five years. Um, and so you'll see that France is 40%, this is homeopathy, Germany 32%, UK 5%. And there's a similar low figure. Um, there's a higher figure in Germany, as you could see, for herbal medicine and naturopathy. Um, and the naturopathy is striking in Germany with only 8% and 2% in the UK and France. And then French seem to be much higher on chiropractic. Um, 
uh, uh, which is which is interesting. And so my 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 takeaway message here is that the the culture of the country um, has a great influence on um, on these um, usage of different health 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 um, modalities. So in France, for instance, you have homeopathic pharmacies, and you can get homeopathy um, you know, in mainstream um, uh, pharmacies. Whereas in, in the UK, and I think this is a big factor that in the none of the above figure, where the UK says 59%, there is a very active quackbusters movement um, headed by Simon Singh. And he's, he's aiming um, to eliminate government funding for complementary medicine uh, and close down as many uh, complementary medical departments in universities as he can. And, and he's, he's, he's of the view that there is no reliable evidence for any of these, these uh, approaches, which is in fact wrong. Um, but um, the, the sceptical movement applied to complementary medicine um, is very strong, as it also is in relation to parapsychology. That culturally, what we've got a, an absolutely fascinating um, result here, because France, which we would consider to be historically the most secular of countries, um, yes, and and likewise to some extent Germany with um, its history, um, ha have very clear uh, empathy for alternative medical practices, or I, I don't even like to use the word alternative medical practices, but there's an empathy for that, that we would not expect within that secular society. Um, British... It's mainly homeopathy in France, as you can see. Um, yeah. that, that Because if you look at the other figures, naturopathy and, and herbal medicine, um, they are they're much lower. And uh, no, homeopathy home, home, home and chiropractic as well. Yeah, we, we uh, a group of us went through the survey, and we we were really interested in these regional variations. But in the New Zealand context, I would hazard a guess that we would mirror almost exactly the the British. Um, okay. Or the UK understanding simply because of you know, the colonial movement. Yes. Uh, yes. And <clears throat> there's a, a fascinating part of New Zealand history in, um, from about 1900 through to post-World War One, where uh, there was a, a, an act of parliament that specifically excluded what were called tohunga practices. These were the medical practices of the um, indigenous Maori people. And the suppression of the Tauhanga Act um, uh, was considered to be a kind of a breakthrough thing in terms of improving Maori health. Uh, and and I, I would be unsurprised if there weren't similar kinds of exclusionary things going on in different ways in uh, UK uh, France and Germany, uh, but some things have made it through, as it were. And when you said about Simon Singh, uh, I mean, very famous in terms of writing books about mathematics and code breaking, etc. But uh, very interesting news to hear that he is spearheading that sort of um, rationalist attack. <laughs> um, maybe not unexpected. Exactly. I mean, it's a very old debate, but it goes on um, really in the areas of complementary medicine and parapsychology in particular. Exactly, and which is part of your area of brilliant expertise. Um, religious affiliation, David, uh, I'd like to guide us through that. Yes. Well, again, um, what you see here um, is that the, um, the, the proportions of atheists and agnostics are under 50% in all three countries. And you see very similar in France and, and, and lower in Germany. And so again, this um, uh, sends the message that, it, that, that under 50%, less than a majority of scientists, at least in this survey, um, are um, atheist and agnostic. 
Um, and you'll see um, in, in agnostics, the highest figure in the UK, if you break that figure down, and atheists in France. Um, again, this is a cultural thing um, that you, if you're not um, a Catholic in France, you're much more likely to be <clears throat> an atheist um, because the, there's a polarization um, within the society. And then um, the high, Germany was higher church attendance, which correlates with the lower um, atheist and agnostic figure. So 49% is very high. Um, that's um, semi-regular, not every week, but semi-regular church attendance. And then the, if um, religion and spirituality are important to your life, uh, the UK has the highest figure. Um, which is a, a, just about a third, and France, 20, France and Germany a quarter. And, and so that's also an interesting finding. And then this um, spiritual but not religious, SBNR, uh, I was surprised to see that figure as low as it was. I thought it might be higher um, than 14, 14 and sort of the average of 13% overall. So that... that yeah. Yeah. Do you draw any conclusion out of that that you you were expecting perhaps these figures to be reversed? You were expecting more people to declare themselves spiritual but not religious, but we seem to have the reverse effect going on. More people are declaring themselves religious or having some form of religious affiliation and church attendance. Uh, yes. I mean, the thing is that there's. A um, there's there's 44 pages of 44 sheets of data here, yeah, and so um, there's, there's an enormous amount of detail that one can't summarise onto a slide like like this. Um, and that one of the things that comes out is is the and this is uh, consistent with um, other surveys is is the higher prevalence of of spirituality and religion among women and than among men and so that, that's a but that's a general finding ollie robinson <clears throat> um, who is a, 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 a psychologist at greenwich university and he presented um, a paper to the annual meeting um in plymouth uh, where he looked specifically at these gender effects and compared them with other surveys Okay, um, that's something we, we, we may come back to because I think it's an interesting thing okay. that appears to work across culture, um, not just specific to one regional difference kind of thing. Um, <laughs> now, this next slide is a very interesting one as well. Um, so the question is, is what, what do people think is the status of consciousness in the relation to the brain? Uh, and you can think that they're the um if you look at the figures for atheism and agnosticism and um, then you'll see that not every atheist and agnostic uh, if you look at the figures from the previous slide and believes that consciousness is only in the brain and and you'll see that here um the uk has the highest figure 38 percent and uh, behind that figure uh, more young people um they're 25 to 34 under 34 and um, think that consciousness is in the brain and uh, consciousness beyond the brain as you would expect uh, because it's only in the brain is highest in the uk beyond the brain is lowest in the uk uh, and in france and germany a quarter and a third um, think that consciousness is beyond the brain now what's interesting i think in this slide is that a third of the sample say well we can't know they're agnostic which is far more than people who say they don't know. And so if you put the don't know and the can't know together, then you get, you know, 45% roughly. And, and so there is a sort of element of mystery here. And, and I suppose I would have, um, uh, I, I think I would, um, I would have tried to remove that third category because I think it's sort of, um, no, can't know, and is a little bit dodging the issue um 
and so I would have preferred the survey uh, not to have had that, to have had in the brain, beyond the brain, don't know, rather than can't know and don't know. Was Rupert Sheldrake able to make any observation about this particular um, data? Because, uh, you know, all of it, his experiments with um, um, the sense of being stared at, um, the, the, the perceptions of animals in relation to their owners, etc. Um, I might have expected that, that there would be a higher response rate amongst the scientists who work with, uh, you know, in biology particularly, or zoology, uh, a, a sort of an awareness of, you know, maybe things don't stop at the surface of the skin. But was Rupert um, well, able I think to make the, any observation I mean, about the, it? No, I, these figures are, well, we've got some of Rupert's questions coming up later, um, but these these figures are, um, I think fairly standard. I mean, among among neuroscientists, as you probably know, it's, it's very rare for people um, to believe that consciousness is beyond the brain or can be beyond the brain. Um, but that's mainly because, um, of, you know, as you'll see later in the survey, ignorance of the data. That, that people um, that talk about, you know, jump to conclusions about these areas. Um, when uh, they simply don't, they're not acquainted with the literature, and there's no incentive to be acquainted with the literature, but, but because um, the, there's, there's a self-reinforcing system that if you're going to conform to the expectation of um, a scientific view, um, then you've got to be very careful about what you, the, the opinions you voice, if you want your career to stay on track. Yeah. Point there, very good point. Okay, um, now we move to this distinction between uh, religion and spirituality. Yes, now again, we see you've got three possibilities here. Um, that um, you know, science and religion is the first, that's SR. So science and religion complementary, um, those figures are about 20% on average. That uh, they're independent. Um, the, um, the, this, I, this I thought was um, an interesting finding. Cause nearly half the survey um, feel that science and religion are in fact independent domains uh, with different ways of knowing. Um, and contradictory, again, in the UK figures slightly higher to quarter, and France and Germany, um, you know, 20%, a fifth. And then if you look at um, the complementarity or otherwise of science and <clears throat> um, spirituality, which is the second part, um, then you'll see that um, the figures are almost identical in the UK, um, but significantly higher in France and slightly higher in Germany. But the independent is still largely the same, slightly higher, if anything, even near, nearly 50%. And the contradictory, and this is interesting, I think, um, that, that if you look at the figures for science and religion are contradictory and science and spirituality are contradictory, you'll see there's a lower figure for science and spirituality being contradictory, and significantly lower, 9% lower in the UK, 10% <clears throat> lower um, in France, but only slightly lower in Germany, um, which is perhaps where they reflected in the higher church attendance. And so they don't make such a distinction between science and sorry, between spirituality and religion. Also, so do you for think... me, the, yeah, oh, carry on. Well, or do you think, David, that the there's a possibility that uh, as science itself changes, uh, and this was a movement, I think, that started with the quantum physics in the 20s and 30s and has, has spread um, into other areas, that a strictly materialist view cannot possibly hold within those worlds of the subatomic regions. 
And so there's, there's an, a sense, maybe not mystery is not the right word, but there's a sense of reverence or awe for the phenomena that are being looked at and, and an acknowledgement that there may be other ways of dealing with this than simply trying to find the, under, the underlying mathematical realities. Um, so that spirituality has come to mean something that's actually intertwined with the scientific enterprise um, for a considerable number of scientists, that, that they don't see a contradiction between uh, science and spirituality because, in a sense, they've become so passionate about the way they do science that it's becoming more and more inbuilt. Do you see that as a possibility? Well, I think, it, I think it depends a lot on different disciplines as well. I think, um, it, for me, um, physicists tend to be more open than biologists um, to these, these areas and to this kind of view, uh, but because of the extraordinary paradoxes and, and com complexities that physicists have to accept if they're going to get to grips with quantum mechanics and non-locality. Um, whereas biology is much more focused on on the physiology on the brain, and and I think that well, by and large bio, biologists are more materialistic than than physicists. Well, I, I think that the what is closest to spirituality in relation to the this interface is not so much science and religion. This this is my view anyway, but as science and mysticism, or spirituality and mysticism, because spirituality and mysticism are both um, based on experience, whereas for me, um, theology is more a question of um, you know, rational argument and, and um, you know, argument for um, certain propositions and against other propositions, which is more abstract. And so that, that's, so I think that the science and religion debate is, is slightly different from the science and spirituality um, debate or interface. And again, the science and <clears throat> um, mysticism uh, interface, and, and you could add to that, and I've just been writing a, um, a, a short essay on mystics and scientists um, for a journal, um, the relationship between science and esotericism, um, which is you know, yet another one of these, these interfaces. Where the, the esoteric view is that um, the, the inner science, as it were, can complement and the third person or outer science uh, and extend its range without contradicting its 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 basis okay thank you for that um, just very brief overview of uh, what uh, practices uh, go on in terms of religion and spirituality yeah so this this one um, the, the meditation here is is for spiritual purposes, whereas meditation in the first slide was for stress reduction. Um, so there's a bit of a difference. So these are the these are the practices that the survey respondents said they 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 went in for uh, once or more a month, and so it's a consolidated figure um, from the data. Um, and so you see that meditation is is nearly in the UK is nearly up to 20%. So that's really, that's really quite high. And, and it's not insignificant in France and Germany either. And um, I was surprised to find that prayer was higher than meditation in, in each country, sometimes significantly more. Um, and um, that the higher church going in Germany um, See, was didn't mean that Germany was significantly more. The, this German survey people were significantly more use of prayer than the UK. So I think the high. I think it's a high figure for the UK for prayer, and then spiritually based exercise. So this would be Tai Chi or yoga, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> pretty equivalent in in the UK and France, but uh, higher in Germany. Again, I would I would correlate this probably with a higher um, in emphasis on natural health in Germany than in the other countries. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very interesting point. When we went through the survey, we didn't pick that up at all. So yeah, thank you for that. 
Um, just moving across, across now, uh, what you've called experiences. Now, there's there's a uh, there's a tremendous difference between each of these experiences. Would you like to just guide yes. us through this? Yes. Well, what we asked is is um, these were a number of questions that we wanted to know about. Um, had they personally experienced any of these things? Had any of them taken taken hallucinogenic drugs? And what you'll see here is, is a figure, as an overall figure, and then a breakdown between the countries. And in some cases, the, um, the, the, the differences are significant, in other cases not. So in, in the case of the hallucinogens, um, the UK is, is way ahead of France um, and Germany. And I should, I should add um, that the, the gender um, balance within the sample um, is almost identical. It's pretty much 50% men and 50% women in each of the countries. Apparitions, um, I found it interesting that the UK was was higher on this, significantly higher. I don't know whether um, the literature is more developed in the UK or not. And notice that we used in the survey, we said, we didn't say, have you seen a ghost? Um, we said, have you have you had the experience of seeing an apparition? Um, so we, we, we were quite scrupulous in our use of terms. We didn't want to popularize the term too much. Now, telephone telepathy, um, this is um, corresponds to one of Rupert's experiments. Um, as you may know, he's done very extensive um, experiments, um, um, multiple studies on telephone telepathy, text um, telepathy, um, and um, so you're sending texts um, and uh, email um, telepathy. Um, somebody's about to send you an email, uh, and so you will see there that the um, uh, the figures are um, fifty percent, um, <clears throat> which uh, is very interesting. Um, in other words, that that's slightly more than half of, of, of the of the survey, and this is. Um, have had an experience of telephone telepathy. In other words, um, you've thought of somebody, then they've rung you, you know, within a few minutes of thinking of them. Now, if you look at um, Rupert's findings on that in the general public um, are about 80%. And so this is a lower figure um, than the general public figure, but it's still a very significant figure. And the sense of being stared at um, and I think this is higher among women than men, as far as I remember. Uh, fairly comparable, but slightly higher in the UK. Um, premonition by a pet. And this is a very interesting question. Um, and, and I find that really quite surprising and amazing that you know, a fifth people in the survey say that, they, that, that a pet they have seems to have had a premonition about something or knew, known that something disastrous is going to happen. Of course, you'd have to cash that out and say, well, what do you mean? What sort of thing are you referring to? Um, <clears throat> high figure for precognitive dreams. Now, a third of the survey have had a precognitive dream. Um, and so you would think that um, this would really make you question your you know, a, a strict materialist approach to reality and, and time if you've had a precognitive dream. Higher in France, as you can see, again, again, higher among women. And then out of body and near death experiences, this is pretty standard, I think, for um, the population as a whole, you know, 8% and 5%. And so th those are, those are, those are, so I think it's, I think the, um, some of these figures are very interesting in, in you know, higher prevalence than, than you might expect. The, the 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 range that's in that one slide is actually enormous, and <laughs> one could spend a, you know quite a yes. bit of time on on a, a number of those particular topics. And I I will come back to one just uh, in a in a little while. Um, the, the next slide asks, I think, uh, how their worldview changed as a result of yes, this. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> and you this this again was not. Not a, not a very surprising 
um, uh, finding the, the top two lines that the the near death experience and the out of body experience were some, were, the, were the most powerful transformative experiences, um, and hallucinogenic um, uh, sixteen percent. And then I think what was also very interesting is if you if you look at the combination of it either confirmed my view or um, there was no change in my view. Uh, that um, that's seventy five percent. And so, so the the the, the change in worldview, people's obviously people will interpret these experiences within their own framework, and and so maybe if you already have a materialistic framework, these things aren't going to make much difference, except if you have an NDE or an OBE, which is a bit more arresting. Yeah, I, uh, that's that's unsurprising in some ways because of the the nature of the event that you're going through. It cannot help oh. but but change you in some respects. Um, I'll, I'll, yes. <laughs> this is a fascinating. Yes. This was another question we wanted to ask because we we thought, um, are, are you embarrassed um, to talk about these sorts of experiences with in general and with your colleagues? And, and you'll see that um, they're under... The, these figures are quite interesting because the the French people are only a quarter were embarrassed, whereas over half the Germans um, and a third of the uh, of the UK. And, and what's also interesting, um, and I would have poss possibly expected the opposite, um, except I suppose in terms of how people see themselves, that they're less embarrassed to talk about these things with their colleagues. Um, than they are in general, if you look at these figures. And I, I, I would have thought the, you know, you might be more embarrassed to talk talk to your colleagues because you might feel that they would ridicule you more. But but it must be that 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 people would be more embarrassed in the public because they feel they'd somehow lose face more among the public than among their colleagues. I don't know. This is that speculate that speculation to, on my part as to why these findings should have come up. Well, that's been an absolutely fascinating uh, series of explanations of the slides, David. I'd like to draw our evening to a close with this um, observation from the uh, Auckland scene uh, in terms of experience, spirituality, religion, um, and the science interface. We had an experience with a, a family in the church, and uh, the mother and father are very happy for this to be public and have been so for um, quite some time. They had a very beautiful young daughter, a young woman who uh, died of um, cancer, at, and uh, I was the... Um, Methodist presbyter or minister at the time. Uh, so a, a number of months after, um, the uh, the uh, mother and father, Weeking and Anne, asked uh, me to go and listen to a phenomenon. And I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but I went to, to their home and they took me into a particular location uh, in the home, and they said at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, if you stand in this spot, you will hear a series of uh, very similar to chimes, Chinese chimes mm. as if in the distance. And uh, they explained that this had this phenomenon had started when in fact they had returned to Malaysia to visit relatives' funeral. And the first time that Weeking heard it was in an elevator. And this set of chimes, which is very, very faint, had followed them round into different locations, locations uh, throughout Malaysia and back into their own home here in Auckland. Because I was following these kinds of... Um, 
phenomenon uh, through the scientific and medical network, uh, particularly back in the 90s and early 2000s, there were, there were odd little snippets that would appear in the magazines of similar kinds of experience. I, I, they're not in the category of apparition. Uh, we, we weren't seeing things, but this, the, uh, I listened and I heard exactly what they were describing. There were 21 chimes. It, it was a beautiful effect but it was faint. And if you moved out of the particular location, you no longer heard it. Okay. With their permission, I then asked uh, Dr. Leo Hobbes, I don't know whether you recall Leo, but he was a uh, nuclear physicist, um, instrumental in sure. setting up the Auckland group. Uh, and I asked a, a fellow Methodist minister, presbyter, to to come with me and uh, Weeking and Anne were perfectly happy. They'd shared the experience with a number of friends. So we all went back uh, a little bit later and we, we listened. Now my Methodist colleague, uh, Reverend Cedric Hay, also heard this inexplicable sound. It was a very beautiful, very distant chiming and it was always 21 times. And uh, uh -huh. the Lee family noted that over the course of months, that the intensity uh, of the sound, the level of the sound, had been um, declining steadily. And in fact, it turned out that uh, for the next, they continued to hear the chimes for, I think, about another year, but progressively getting further and further away until no longer audible. So my colleague, uh, the Reverend Cedric Hay, heard the chimes. Um, Leo, did not. But Leo had brought, wait for it, a portable tape recorder. And we said, well, Leo, put the, put the, have the tape going. And he put the recorder, I held it up like that to listen to the chimes. Leo was c convinced that we had all heard something. There was no question that we, ha you know, we were adamant yes. that we'd yes. heard things. He hadn't. Uh, and in fact, when he had the tape analysed by another person that was loosely associated with the local SMN group, who was an audio engineer, this person was able to amplify and actually bring up on the tape the chimes. And Leo I see. heard it. And he was as astonished as anyone because he had assumed that that though our experience was genuine, it was not recordable. Yes, and, quite, absolutely. Uh, so we, we agreed that at that time there, there were uh, huge numbers of pastoral sensitivities. Uh, it was a very raw experience, but uh, we, King and Anne, were only too willing to share what they had heard, and we also heard since then. I've spent years trying to think of an explanation. And uh, just prior to our having this online meeting, a few weeks ago, I asked Leo about where the tape was because I would love to have been able to have played it. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they had been through a number of uh, house shifts and he was no longer able to locate it. Um, and he does apologise. He's he's now in his ninetieth uh, year, and and he sends his apologies for not being able to come online to, to talk to you tonight. Okay, greetings, yeah, indeed. But uh, he heard his own tape recording of it, and that changed everything. And I, I'm just telling that story because I think it's the kind of experiential thing. Of course, it's completely subjective, and of course, it's completely objective in that eventually all of us who went to hear it heard it, as did a number of uh, uh, the Lee family friends and acquaintances. So, and, but it's taken a long time, not just because of the pastoral sensitivity issues, but also because of the potential for embarrassment of talking about we heard, uh, it's not a voice, it was a very distinctive set of chimes, uh, as, as if on a wind, is the only way I can yes. describe it. And yet it, it is the most vivid, 
um, real spiritual experience because I cannot fit it into my uh, theological religious framework uh, except to call it something of a mystery of the grace of God. Because there was feeling on the part of the family and certainly for myself and my Methodist colleague that what we had experienced was in some sense a significant sign to say that all was well but not all was explainable, explicable. Yes. Any comments? Yes. Well, <clears throat> um, first of all, is there any um, significance you know, in relation to Christine and to, to Chimes? I mean, is, that anything, is there any connection between her and Chimes? The, uh, the, she was a very skilled um, young pianist, um, but okay. that's the only musical connection. Uh, the music, mu there's a musical, um, a musical thing. And then how did you say she was, she was 21? Uh, she was in and her early. Died. I think she might have been twenty-two, or possibly a little bit older, when she eventually died. Yes. Now I just wonder that whether this there's any significance between uh, in in the number of times the chimes were heard and the age at which she died. No, I don't think so. I spent a lot of time thinking about the number twenty-one and various um, symbolic interpretations that have been given to that. Um, it is. In Chinese literature, it's, if I remember correctly, it's a very hallowed number. Um, ah, okay. But yeah, that's about as far as I, I've been able to get into it. The the other the other more broad remark would be that um, that there's a whole field called after death communications, um, which is not necessarily. Um, you know, apparitions and, and, and sort of classic things, but, but other, other senses are involved as well. So that, um, for instance, you would get somebody who loved roses, for instance, and uh, they, after they died, a smell of roses would come into the house. And, and so there are many different modalities for communicating um, and reassuring those who are still here that you're okay, because that's the fundamental message of, of all these after-death communications is for, for, for the, the deceased to reassure those still alive in the physical that they're okay. And once they feel they've got the message through, they can move on. They don't need to hang around. And I think the distancing, you know, the, the, was <clears throat> what that you talked about, the fact that they got more faint they might be indicative of the fact that she was moving on if this is a phenomenon associated um, with her, um, which it, it would seem quite probable that it was. Hmm. Well, look, thank you very much for that, uh, particularly, but thank you very much in general, David, for making your time available to talk. Um, okay. Thanks and greetings to all of you and uh, have a good rest of your evening.